Cool. So hello, everyone, and welcome to your overseas home virtual event. My name is Ryan Timms, and I'm your host for this seminar, um, The Tax Essentials of Moving to Spain. Thank you for joining us um, on a Saturday, even though I know it's nice and sunny outside, but hopefully you're tuning in to watch um, this webinar today. So we um, hope um, to make it worth your while. For this seminar, we are joined by um, Nicole, uh, a private wealth manager from um, Chase Buchanan, uh, with over 25 years experience in financial services. So before I give um, Nicole the floor, I'd like to, I'd like to let you know we'll be um, opening um, uh, uh, the Q&A for questions after the presentation. Should you have any as we go along, please type them into your questions tab um, below and, uh, and I can ask them on your behalf. So um, Nicole, it'd be great if you could please introduce yourself and Chase Buchanan before starting um, your presentation. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Well, hello, everybody. It's a, it's really nice to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, it's also really nice and sunny where I am in Spain. It's uh, 24 degrees today, so uh, it's particularly nice. I'll just very briefly explain who I am and who Chase Buchanan are uh, before we get into the tax essentials of moving from your home country to Spain. So I am a private wealth manager with Chase Buchanan. Uh, I'm Australian and I've been living in Javier, which is quite a small coastal town on the Costa Blanca in Spain for over nine years now. Uh, and before I moved here, I actually lived in the UK for eight years, working for St. James's Place Wealth Management for around eight years as a, as a financial planner. So although I'm Australian, my area of expertise is very much between the UK and Spain, but I do have a lot of clients from all of, all over the world. Um, so I very much help foreign nationals navigate through the complexities and the challenges of moving from the country that they're living in now to Spain in a really strategic and simple way. Um, just uh, on Chase Buchanan as well, they are a global and independent wealth management company. So I run the office based in Javier, and we have another office in Marbella and another office in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And we're very much a global company. Uh, we focus mostly on tax optimization investment vehicles. So in Spain, it's Spanish tax compliant investments to help reduce the taxes that I'll be walking you through this afternoon, uh, but also pension transfers when it's relevant, uh, estate planning and overall strategic tax planning. So we're not accountants. Um, but if anybody needs any useful contacts, just from being here for so long, myself and the team have lots and lots of useful contacts. So if you do need to speak to somebody about visas or immigration, if you want to speak to an accountant to perhaps do a mock income tax return, which I think is quite a useful idea, or you need a mortgage broker or a lawyer or somebody to draft a will, whatever it is, just let me know and I can point you in the right direction for whatever it may be. Um, just to say at the outset, I'm really conscious that it's going to sound like I'm talking at 100 kilometers an hour about so many different things, and some of them are quite complicated. Don't worry if it sounds daunting or overwhelming. I wouldn't recommend to sit there and try and write anything down because we're recording this anyway, and you're very welcome to book uh, a free consultation session with myself or one of my colleagues uh, I'll put a QR code, a direct link to my diary on the final slide, plus my contact details. So I would recommend to try and just watch it rather than retain all the information because we'll cover a lot of ground. If anyone watching is American uh, with uh, US regulations, uh, I can't actually advise Americans myself, but my colleague Alex Ingram can. He's American, he's based in Italy, and he helps Americans relocate from wherever they're living into Europe. So if you are American, reach out to me as well and I can point you in the right direction. Okay. I think the best place to start is to talk about the Spanish tax year in residency because this will typically dictate when in the year you move to Spain. Do you move in the first six months of a year and what does that mean? Or do you move in the second half of a year and what does that mean from a tax point of view? So usually residency will drive when you end up moving here. So it's really important to understand this because it can have huge tax implications if you get it wrong. And um, the simplest thing about Spanish taxation is that the tax year is a calendar year. It's January to December. So it's nice and clean and simple. 
Um, and Spain's actually split into 17 different autonomous regions and they all do their own thing from a tax perspective. So it's important to know where you're looking at moving to because if you're looking at Catalonia, for example, the differences there are completely, uh, it's completely different to Andalusia. So it's important to know which part of Spain you're looking at so we can drill down on the specifics of the taxation in that region. So you are deemed to be a Spanish tax resident if the following, if any of the following three apply. Um, the first is if you spend 183 days, which is six months or more in a calendar year in Spain. Um, or perhaps your centre of economic interest is in Spain, so majority of your assets are in Spain or your job is based in Spain, that can also make you a tax resident. Or well, the final one would be if you have a spouse or dependent children living in Spain. So that usually applies to offshore workers. That can actually make you a Spanish tax resident. So it's not necessarily about this six-month rule. There are these other two just to be aware of as well. So as soon as you spend six months or more in a calendar year in Spain, you are subject to tax on your worldwide income and gains in Spain. So these are your fiscal obligations as a Spanish resident. So you're subject to income tax, capital gains tax, something called wealth tax. There's a declaration of any overseas assets called a Modelo 720 uh, and also succession tax and gift tax, which is like inheritance tax in Spain. So what I'm going to do is walk you through each one of these taxes in high level detail over the next few slides. So this is all if you're a Spanish resident. So income tax, as I've said, that's payable on your worldwide income, regardless of where it's based. If you live in Spain, you're subject to tax in Spain. Keep in mind there are double taxation agreements between most countries now in Spain. So if you do have assets or income um, that derives in another country, usually the double taxation treaty would exist, certainly between the UK and Spain, for example, which means you won't pay the ta same tax twice. So uh, the Spanish accountant would credit you for any taxation that you've already paid in the other country. So it will even itself out. Um, income tax, so is split into two different camps. You've got the general rates of income tax, which is for things like earned income if you're self-employed or you are employed, pension income usually falls into this category, rental income, and then you've got something called savings income, and that includes capital gains tax, uh, dividend income, interest income, and some investment income as well. So you've got the general rates and the savings rates. The general rates will typically change throughout each region of Spain by a few percent. And the savings rates are the same all around Spain, they're national rates. So as we go through, I'll point out what is a regional rule and what is a national rule so that you're aware. Uh, income tax is due by the end of June each year. So for example, uh, in 20, all, the, all of 2022's income, was due to be declared by the 30th of June, 2023. So I've mentioned already these rates will differ for each region around Spain. So the state rules, so that's led by the Madrid government, these are central rules, they range from 19 to 47%. Where it usually differs is at the top end. So for example, in Andalusia, their top rate is 47%. It's quite a progressive tax region, I think, Andalusia. Um, uh, and in Comunidad Valenciana, for example, where I am, it's just over 54%. Um, in saying that, though, with the comment about Andalusia, a lot of people say to me, well, which is the best tax region of Spain? And we'll focus on that one because they're quite daunted by Spanish taxation. I think it has a bad reputation for being quite tax heavy, which isn't always, uh, always the case. Uh, I would never recommend to move somewhere because of tax because things change so rapidly in Spain. And as I say, each region does their own thing from a tax point of view. So if you move to a great tax region today, it could be totally different tomorrow. So I would personally say move to where suits your personal and life qualities and let taxation follow through from that because it changes so frequently in Spain, a lot more frequently than Australia or the UK, for example. Um, you do have a personal allowance in Spain, which is a really common question. Uh, it's 5,550 euros. And then there are additional allowances for joint returns, uh, 
certain income levels, age allowances and dependents. So what I would recommend to do quite early on is to register with a good Spanish accountant. I, I could point you in the direction of an accountant because as I said at the outset, perhaps I could do a, a mock income tax return if you're really worried about taxation in Spain. Um, and I think the calculations aren't that clear cut. It's not so easy to look at how something works and think, oh, well, based on my assets, I should be paying X amount. There's a, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more depth with the actual calculations. So personally, I would recommend just to speak to an accountant, get a mock tax return done if you wish. Um, but also they're very useful because they can help you with all your residency documents, point you in the direction of a lawyer if you purchase a property and need a will. Um, and it's just, it's something that will give you a lot of peace of mind that everything is done on time and correctly. I know in a lot of other countries, especially the UK, it's quite easy to do self-assessments in your own tax returns. I live and breathe Spanish taxation and I would never do my own tax return ever. I would never dream of it. So I would definitely recommend to use an accountant from the outset. Um, so that's the general rates of income tax. They're the ones that differ slightly in each region of Spain. And then you've got the savings rates, which includes capital gains tax. So these range from 19% up to 28 percent then we have wealth tax which is just super unpopular it's got a really uh bad history i think in in spain it was reinforced after the the financial crisis uh, to try and equalize uh wealth across spain so this also uh, changes region to region so what this is uh it's due around uh, april time each year and um, between April and June. So this is where at the end of the year before, they will look at the value as of the 31st of December of your worldwide assets, if you're a Spanish resident. And if your asset, global assets exceed the allowances, only then you need to submit a wealth tax return. And it's only the excess over the allowance that's subject to wealth tax. And the rates range from 0.2% up to 3.5%. Now, there is an individual personal allowance of 700,000 euros per person, plus there's a main home allowance of 300,000 euros per person. So it's only the excess over these allowances that's subject to tax. Um, some regions differ. So for example, where I am, we have 500,000 euros as the allowance. It's reduced from 700,000. So it may differ from region to region. And in fact, some regions have even eliminated wealth tax, such as Mercia, uh, Andalusia, and it's been exempt. Um, yeah, sorry, it's been exempt in Madrid. So I was just caught, caught with re reading something that flashed on the screen. Um, so again, it will change region to region. Um, and I think the calculation, it, this is definitely not one that you could look at and, and try and calculate yourself because some assets are valued in different ways, um, such as property is a really different value to other sorts of investments. Um, there are limitations to the rule to help to try and reduce wealth tax in some situations. So it's really not a clear-cut calculation that you could do yourself. It's a whole spreadsheet of a calculation. So again, I would recommend just to use an accountant for your, your sanity's sake and to have a more accurate understanding of what your wealth tax liability might be. So um, when Andalusia came out and abolished wealth tax a couple of years ago, centrally Spain uh, as a country came out and introduced something called national solidarity tax. And this is supposed to be a two-year temporary measure, which I won't hold my breath about. So as I say, this came from Madrid. So this is a national rule. It's not a regional rule. However, it only affects those who have a net wealth of over 3 million euros. It works in a really similar way to wealth tax. Um, the tax rates are on a sliding scale, starting at 1.7%. And it doesn't affect a lot of people. I mean, 90% of wealth tax pay payers in Spain will not pay solidarity tax. So it doesn't affect a huge portion of the population. You have the same uh, reductions as wealth tax and the, the taxes work together. So your accountant will credit you against any wealth tax already uh, already paid. Um then there's something, so this is a declaration. It's not a tax return. It's purely a declaration. It's something called a Modelo 720. So this is due at the end of March each year. 
Uh, and it's just to say to Spain, look, this is what we have outside of Spain with a value greater than 50,000 euros. It doesn't generate any tax. As I say, it's purely a declaration and they will look at the value as at the 31st of December, the year before of your global assets. Um, so they essentially report three different categories, bank accounts, financial assets and property. Uh, again, this is just something you would just lay everything on the table with an accountant and they would pick and choose what needs to be reported and when. So you've got complete peace of mind. I wouldn't worry about trying to keep up with all of these different tax returns and declarations. Your accountant will just prompt you on it in good time each year um, if you need to submit one. Then we have succession tax, which is inheritance tax in Spain, and it's banded together with, uh, with gift tax. So there's two occasions when inheritance or succession tax applies in Spain. One is if the asset is physically in Spain. So say you have a Spanish property and it's passing to family or friends who live outside of Spain. Because it's physically a Spanish asset, inheritance tax will apply. So that's the first scenario, if it's a Spanish asset. The second scenario is if the beneficiary or the recipient lives here in Spain. So if you live in Spain and you inherit from anybody anywhere in the world, you have to pay the tax bill. So this works in the complete opposite way to a lot of countries, especially the UK, where it's deducted from the deceased estate. For Australia, we don't have uh, death taxes at all because you've already, already been taxed in your lifetime. Uh, but in Spain, if you inherit, you have to pay the tax and you only have six months to declare it and pay the tax. And you can't sell an asset and use the proceeds to pay the tax. So it becomes quite complicated for some people. Uh, so if the asset or the beneficiary lives in Spain, this is when it's due. And then what they do is they split the beneficiaries into four different categories, depending on the closeness of the relationship to the deceased. I'll show you what these four beneficiary categories are uh, on the next slide. But again, it, you know, just to keep consistent, it's also a rather complicated calculation because there's exemptions, there's different rates and multiplier effects in the calculation, and it's all determined on what category that person, that beneficiary sits in. Um, I've put on here that unmarried partners pay high rates. So if you're not married, uh, but you're in a relationship, if you haven't formally registered that in Spain, like a de facto relationship, you don't have to get married. You could get married because it's actually quite simple from uh, an administration point of view compared to this. But see a notary or a lawyer and at least register as Perecha de Echo because then you will have the same allowances and reductions as if you were married. Because even if you've been with someone for 50 years but you've never formalised that relationship, it, it you're taxed quite heavily unfortunately so just that's something to speak to a, a lawyer about I can explain it to you in more detail um but then the tax rates in Spain range from seven percent up to 34 percent for inheritance taxes uh and they definitely differ vastly region to region luckily in the region that I'm in now which wasn't one of the best regions they're actually looking to eliminate succession tax between spouses and children same with the Balearic Islands Andalusia is very, very generous. Uh, so is Madrid. Catalonia is generous for spouses. So they all work in really, really different ways for this particular tax. Uh, and this is something I think uh, that changes a lot. So in my nine years here, I think the rates in my region have changed about four times. Um, and these are the four groups of beneficiaries. So essentially spouses and children or direct ascendants and descendants, close family, will have the most amount of uh, allowances. Um, and then group three is, are other family members, including stepchildren. So estate planning becomes really important uh, with uh, stepchildren relationships, stepparent relationships, and just in general, estate planning is really important in Spain because of the way that they, they group these beneficiaries. And then group four, which basically has no allowances or reductions, would be unmarried or partners who haven't formalised their relationship in the eyes of Spain. Uh, and everybody else. And um, so this is something we focus on a lot with people that we speak to. It's not just about some investments or pensions. Estate planning is a huge piece of the puzzle that we work in with, uh, with our clients' objectives. So on that as well, in, in the world of uh, estate planning, Spanish wills, I think, can differ quite a lot to other countries, especially if you're from, say, a common law country. 
So Spain operates a forced airship system. It's something that derives from the Napoleonic Code. So um, what that means is they will dictate how your assets are distributed on debt. And usually a third would go to a spouse or a third to children and a third would be up to your discretion. If you want to choose who your assets pass to, which most people probably do, uh, it's important if you're a foreign national to opt for your country of nationalities law to apply. Again, don't worry about this too much. You can just go directly to a notary or a lawyer if you need it and have a consultation and they will update you on this particular clause. It's something that came out for Brussels for and they add this one sentence to the will, which will cater for that. But just in general with wills, you should have a will in any country where you have assets. And it's best practice to have local wills in each country rather than one sort of international will. It's, it's quicker and more efficient to have local wills. Um, so we can explain that to you in more detail as well. But this is something that's quite different to a lot of other countries. Um, so these are just some really common mistakes. I'm conscious a lot of this is really tilted towards British nationals, um, but actually a lot of this, it, it applies to almost most countries, to be honest. So if you're not British, bear with me because a lot of this will actually apply to you anyway. But any sort of tax-free savings products, especially if, if you're in the UK, things like ISAs, national savings and investment products, or, or anywhere, you know, there's some um, great investments in a lot of different countries and they, they're tax specific for that country. So as soon as you're no longer a tax resident there, they're not tax efficient at all. So you can keep them, but they don't work in Spain at all. And they actually end up being quite tax heavy and you need to report it every year. So um, also offshore bonds that aren't compliant with the Spanish taxation system, again, end up being quite tax heavy and they just don't work well in Spain. Uh, the sale of UK property will attack it, sorry, attract um, Spanish capital gains tax. So, and this is true of most countries. So basically, before you leave your home country, it's a case of reviewing everything that you have and working out what needs to be sold and what you need to keep. Because if anything does have a good tax status wrapped around it, it may be worth selling that or disposing of that in the country that you live in before you become tax resident in Spain. So usually... In most countries around the world, if you've lived in a house for three years or more, it's your main home, and usually you can sell it free of capital gains tax. And this goes back, so I know I'm jumping around a bit, but it goes back to one of my opening slides about the tax year and residency, because if you sell down on your main home and you sell other assets, but you move to Spain in the first half of the year, you're actually going to be Spanish tax resident for the full year. So a lot of people then get surprised where the following year their accountant says, look, you're UK property or you're the sale of these investments are now subject to, to tax in Spain. You've lived here more than six months. So quite often people will do the selling down of things in the first half of the year and perhaps move in the second half of the year so they've not spent more than six months in Spain. But this is something that we plan very heavily with people and we can help put a timeline and a simple strategy together. Um, UK pensions as well. Uh, once you're 55, you can access the UK pension. Uh, which means most pensions you can access up to 25% tax-free. Just to say it's only a UK tax rule. It's fully subject to income tax in Spain. And these are all very common mistakes that we see people make all the time and they haven't reached out for financial advice. Um, the final one on this slide is just about trust. These are really common for Australians or uh, British nationals use a lot of trust for estate planning purposes. In short, they don't work in Spain. Spain don't like trust. It's a common law concept. And Spain is a civil law country. And those two worlds collide from a tax point of view. And they don't work at all. So if you do have any trust, it's important to seek advice on that as well. So I've already talked about a lot of these. But just as a sort of overall checklist, you need to seek regulated financial advice. I would advise you to anyway, before, during and after your move to Spain. We typically will have a meeting with uh, somebody and frequent meetings thereafter to sense check the planning is, is on track the whole way through to get you from A to B in the most tax efficient way possible. Um, another point that changed back in January 2021 that people still don't realise, this is for British nationals, is because of Brexit changes, you can't receive any financial advice from the UK once you're no longer resident there. 
So keep that in mind as well, because a lot of people think, well, I'll just keep what I've got and move across. And that's fine. You can do it. You can't receive any financial advice unless they've got European permissions, which almost none of them do. Um, so I think it's just a case of reaching out, booking a free meeting with myself or one of my colleagues, and we can just go through your personal situation to look at what you have and what actions, if any, uh, you need to, to do before you lose residency in the country that you're in now. Um, I've already mentioned that about the UK home, because that's quite a common mistake. Um, and just estate planning, I've already mentioned that as well, because it's uh, completely different in Spain as to how it is uh, in most countries. I'm not tech savvy at all, and this is my first attempt ever of a QR code, so bear with me. But if you do have an iPhone or an iPad, you're welcome to scan that, and it's a direct link to my diary. You're very welcome to book a free meeting into my diary whenever you like. Um, Otherwise, there's my contact details there as well. So if you need financial planning help about sort of investments, pension, estate planning, reach out and let me know. Or if you just need other useful contacts to talk about v visas or uh, accountancy needs or you're an American, again, just, you know, uh, contact me directly and I can point you in the right direction. I feel like I've spoken really, really quickly. So <laughs> you've done really well to keep up with me if you have. Um, but thanks very much. And any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer if we've got time. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, that, Nicole. It was really in, uh, insightful. Um, we, yeah, we've got a, a few um, questions here. So what are the main um, tax considerations for someone who is looking to move down to Spain from the UK? I know you've um, touched on them quite a lot, but what is kind of the main area that people should focus on? I think the, the the big moves that you, this is a typical situation, it will be different for everyone, but usually the main home is a big consideration because a lot of people say, well, we'll test the water and we'll keep the main home. And that can be a difficult one from a tax point of view. So I think the main home is a main tax consideration and also a pension if you're 55 or older, otherwise you can't access it anyway. Um, and also and it's the vices and things like that. So I think they're probably the main three biggest ones. And usually, I know it's really difficult in the UK with the interest rates being the way that they are and it's quite a sluggish uh, environment for property, but usually the main home will dictate when and how somebody moves across. That's so probably one of the biggest considerations, the main home. Nice, thank you for summarising that. So yeah, Craig has just reached out as well saying, are there any tax implications to be aware of if just buying a property a few years before a final move? That makes sense. No, not at all. I mean, you just, uh, it's all quite straightforward. Again, you would just have a local accountant uh, that would do a, a non-resident tax return. But yeah, no, there's no problems with doing that. A lot of people have second properties here. You do you still need to submit the tax return to Spain, but it's all quite straightforward. Okay, nice. Yeah, I hope that answered your question, Craig. Um, so we've got time for, I think, one more question. Um, so I know you mentioned about wealth tax, but someone's just reached out and said, is there wealth tax in Spain? If so, what's the amount? I'm pretty sure you covered that. Um, yeah, earlier. there is a wealth tax in Spain, but it depends on what region you move to because some regions have eliminated wealth tax. Um, but there is wealth tax. If you're a Spanish resident, it's on your worldwide assets, the value as at the 31st of December, but each asset's valued in slightly different ways. If you're not a Spanish tax resident, there's still wealth tax, but only on assets based in Spain. And then there's allowances of 700,000 euros per person, plus a main home allowance of 300,000 euros per person. And only the excess is what's subject to wealth tax. So it depends on which part of Spain you live in. Okay, nice. Thank you for summarising that. I think a good way to wrap up is, um, could you summarise why people should seek help, uh, professional advice uh, when they move to, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll say that again. Finally, to wrap up, could you summarise why people should seek professional financial advice when they move to Spain and why um, and when it's the best point to do this? Sure. I think to be really blunt, it's to save money. It's to save unnecessary taxation. It's to optimize your situation. Uh, but also, I think, you know, we get really focused on tax and financials. But to put that to one side, it's a really exciting part and chapter of your life. And you get so bogged down with your head starts to swim about all these things with tax and financials. And I think 
use professionals to take all of that headache away because so much of it might not be relevant to you and you might be focusing on the wrong thing. Whereas if you reach out and gain financial advice, you've just got somebody there to sense check things with. You don't have to think about that anymore. That's going to free you up to think about other life things that perhaps are more important to you. And then they can just devise a really clear and simple strategy to get you over to Spain in the best way possible that suits you. And I've mentioned a couple of times, we don't charge fees for these meetings. So you're really welcome to reach out and book a consultation and we can just talk you through what's relevant. So it's to optimize tax and to lessen the burden, I think, to sum it up. No, yeah, that makes complete sense. I mean, I've worked it for a few years now. We've worked with Chase quite closely and we've seen um, Chase help a lot of our clients um, get to where they need to. So definitely reach out um, and you, you got uh, the, the platform will be live uh, until 4 p.m. Um, UK time. So you can either chat to them via their booth or reach out directly. So thank you again for all your insightful tips and advice, uh, Nicole. That's about all we have time for today's session. Um, we thank you again for your knowledge. And if you found this webinar useful, we really do appreciate if you send some feedback um, back by our survey. And once you fill the survey in, there's an opportunity to win a 200 pound flight voucher. Um, our next, um, yeah, our next uh, Portugal seminar is um, later today. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and good luck with everyone with your overseas property plans. Um, goodbye. And thank you again, Nicole, for um, Thanks great a lot. I'm, I'm in the booth now as well. If anyone needs any one to one questions, I, I'm now in the virtual booth. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so she'll be there to answer any of your questions. But yeah, I, I appreciate that. And um, I'll speak soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.